Hi listeners, as you may know, and if you don't, now you do, the Ukraine The Latest team is doing a live podcast recording at the American Embassy in London on the 15th of February. Myself, Dom and Francis will be joined by some fascinating guests and free tickets for Telegraph subscribers are available at the link we will share in the show notes. I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest updates from across Ukraine, discuss the state of Ukrainian politics after days of speculation on the future of General Valery Zeluzhny, and we analyse Putin's NATO strategy and ask what the West must do to counter it. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody is going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday, the 31st of January, One year and 340 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, director of the Centre for East European and International Studies in Berlin and professor at Humboldt University, Gwendolyn Sasse, and Telegraph writer and former tank commander, Hamish de Bratton-Gordon. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, everybody. Hi, David. Hello, Gwendolyn. Welcome. So the latest Ukrainian drone attack on Russia's energy infrastructure came in the early hours of this morning. A drone hit all, an oil refinery in St. Petersburg. The prominent Fontanka and Baza telegram channels said air defences had shot down the drone over the Nevsky Mazut refinery. That's near the centre of the city, just southeast of the city centre. At 4 a.m., uh, supposedly exploded upon impact. Now, they didn't comment on casualties, but this is the third attack on oil facilities in the region in the last month. You'll remember um, the main St. Petersburg oil terminal was hit on January the 18th and the Oost Luga export terminal on the Baltic Sea was hit on the 21st. Ukraine's HUR military intelligence agency have claimed responsibility for the strike. A source from that agency speaking to RBC Ukraine news agency said it was responsible and that it had been intercepted by a Russian S-400 missile. However, the wreckage of the drone still landed on the refinery and exploded, according to the source. The governor of St. Petersburg said only that an incident at an industrial site in the city had occurred last night, which, quote, which required the attention of law enforcement agencies. This is Alexander Beglov. He said there were no casualties, no significant damage to property was caused, but continues the drumbeat. Now, Russia also reported that it downed a Ukrainian drone in the, in the Peskov region. That's in the west of the country. Borders Estonia and Latvia, or well, they're obviously to, to the west of it. Belarus is to the south, St. Petersburg to the north. So I think this is a different drone from the one that hit St. Petersburg, but we're not, not exactly sure on that. However, continued Ukrainian drone strikes against uh, Russia. Now, also last night, Russia launched 20 drones and three missiles at Ukraine. Ukraine's Air Force said it had shot down 14 of 20 drones over the Mykolaiv, Zaporizhia, Dnipropetrovsk, Kurovrad and Kharkiv regions. Now then, on to the, um, the, kind of the, the news that's dominated the agenda of the last sort of 48 hours or so, the whole General Zeluzhny issue. We think that President Zelensky reversed his decision I think he had made his decision to sack General Zeluzny on Monday night, but reversed his decision. This is coming from the Times, The Economist and The Financial Times, all reporting that uh, General Zeluzny had been called to a meeting with Mr. Zelensky and Defence Minister Rustam Amerov on Monday night. Uh, They say he was asked to resign, but refused. Mr. Zelensky apparently said that he would sign a presidential decree to sack him. They also report after a backlash from senior officers, the Ukrainian public, and uh, the international public, General Zeluzny's dismissal was postponed. Now, we, we don't know that. However, the Times Economist and Financial Times, all reputable outlets. And um, so they're quoting their sources. I think that's probably uh, worth a look. Now, Kirill Badanov, um, Ukraine's head of uh, military intelligence, and Colonel General Alexander Sursky, another senior general, both reported to have rejected offers to replace General Zeluzny. Um, speaking of General Badanov, who's head of the HUR that claimed responsibility for the strike in St. Petersburg. 
He said last night that Russia's current offensive would be completely exhausted, his words, by early spring. He then said, we make a move, the enemy makes a move, now is the enemy's turn, it will end, and then ours will start. Now, does that mean that there's going to be an imminent uh, offensive from Ukraine? We don't know. Is this all part of mind games? Very possibly. I mean, that's what he's one of the remits for his job, I would, I would suggest. I don't get the impression that they're on, on the verge of launching something big on the ground. However, we've seen this continued drumbeat from the air. The Black Sea, as I keep going on about, is a is a startling success for um, for Ukraine. So wh- quite what he means by that, we don't know, but I'm sure we'll find out in due course. Mr. Badanov also said that Russia's ongoing offensive had planned to conquer the remaining occupy, unoccupied areas of Donetsk and Luhansk, um, but that it was they were not even close, in his words, to achieving those objectives. We think that Russia is desperate to to try and reclaim the rest of those oblasts prior to March's presidential election in uh, in Russia, more of which in a little bit, in a, a few moments. On to military support for, um, for Ukraine. There's reports that the US is bypassing the current bloc in Congress to arm Kyiv using surplus Greek weaponry. So, here we go, I've been practicing this all morning. Greek newspaper, the Catherine... Me- Me- Catherine- I've been doing this all morning. Catherine Marini. Anyway, a Greek newspaper reported that the White House is using a legal authority known as Excess Defence Articles to send 60 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, 10 aircraft engines, three patrol boats and two C-130H transport aircraft. The um, the Hercules in British military service, they were the, the Hercules, the C-130s. These were said to be free concessions to Athens, but this would enable Greece to send Ukraine um, S-300 missiles and Hawk air defence missile launchers. The paper that I mangled earlier on quoted a letter from Antony Blinken, U.S. Secretary of State, to Ryakos Mitsotakis, who's Greece's prime minister, in which Mr. Blinken said a further 200 million U.S. dollars worth of aid would be on offer if the weapons were sent to Ukraine. Last week, the U.S. approved about an eight and a half billion dollars worth sale of F-35 fighters to Greece. So I think it's all wrapped up in the same thing. Continuing on this theme... The leaders of Germany, Estonia, Denmark, the Netherlands and the Czech Republic have demanded the European Union commits to long-term military aid for Ukraine, speaking, or they penned an article for the Financial Times in which they said, new orders we place today will only reach the battlefield by next year and the EU member states must step up their military support in a collective effort with allies outside the bloc, including Britain and the US. They said, we call on friends and partners of Ukraine to recommit to sustainable long-term military support for Ukraine as a joint European responsibility. This decision must be taken by each and every country. Only then will Ukraine be able to succeed in its defence against Russian aggression. Olaf Scholz, Chancellor of Germany, has joined these calls. He said he called for European countries to continue supporting Ukraine. He said, we will do everything to ensure that the joint contribution from Europe is so huge that Ukraine can build on it and that Putin would not be able to count on our support waning at some point. He was speaking to the Bundestag. Didn't say anything about Taurus. And then just finally on this bit, interestingly, the CIA director has made some public comments. Uh, The director has warned that cutting off uh, US funding to Ukraine would be an own goal of historic proportions. This is Bill Burns, the director of the CIA, described Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a new era for America's for the, for his agency akin to the September 11th attacks he said the post cold war era came to a definitive end the moment Russia invaded Ukraine in February 22 he was writing in foreign affairs magazine he lauded America's role in coalescing an international alliance to back uh, Kyiv but warned the key to success lies in preserving western aid and then just finally for me David Worth noting, only because I think it is smoke and mirrors, but inside Russia, an anti-war Russian presidential candidate has said he has enough signatures from the public to challenge Putin in March's election. So this is Borid Nadezhdin. He has submitted, said he's got 105,000 signatures, which allows him to um, to go forward, according to Central Elect- Election Commission rules. Mr. Nadezhdin has been critical of the war in Ukraine, he needed 100,000 signatures across at least 40 regions of Russia in order to stand in the uh, in the March elections. Putin's side that say that Putin's got three and a half million. 
I mean, I don't, I, I think this is all nonsense. We're going to see this. And I think there'll be more reports of this. And I think it, this is me talking, just my, my view. I think this is so that some of the, some people might say, well, look, there is, there's some transparency here. There's an opposition. There's a vocal opposition in, in Russia. I don't think that's true. I'm not suggesting that this chap is a stooge of Putin. I just, I think he's tolerated because he's, he has so little power and he has no chance of winning. So I don't think we should pay any attention to, or that we shouldn't put any stock in, oh, maybe there will be an electoral upset. I don't think that's the case. But equally, I, I don't think we should be swayed into thinking, wow, there is a thriving democracy in Russia and there's there's candidates standing who oppose Putin and oppose the war. But that's just me talking, David. I might have got it all wrong, a bit like when I tried to pronounce the Greek newspaper. I'll take a pause. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Gwen, thank you so much for joining us. I'm very glad we got your mic working. Just to start, would you just introduce yourself to our listeners and your work? Yes, and thank you very much for having me on this program. My name is Gwendolyn Sasse. I'm the director of a Berlin-based independent research institute, the Center for East European and International Studies. I'm also a professor at Humboldt University in Berlin. But in the past, I was based in the UK at Oxford and various other places. So I keep an eye on UK discussions as well. Well, it's the story of the week, really, from Kiev, the, this rift, the tensions between Zelensky and Zeluzhny and a potential abortive sacking that Dom's taken us through with the appropriate caveats and leaning on the reporting of our, of our esteemed colleagues at other newspapers. What are your thoughts and your take on the, the wider mood music at the top of Ukrainian politics right now? Yeah, I think the most important thing is really to emphasize again that any speculation about this rift and the potential sacking of, of Zaluzhny or resignation of Zaluzhny is bad news. I think we saw very clearly that those outlets that um, immediately uh, distributed this and, and uh, amplified this were many uh, Russian and Russia-affiliated media sources and also uh, sources close to um, Zelensky's rival Poroshenko, his predecessor as president. And it did not, I would say, originate in these with these sources but of course, immediately it gains even more traction and becomes a bigger issue because others hope to benefit from that and amplify it. And that means that it, it should probably at that level, it shouldn't have even come to this if it is true that there were even these direct conversations about a resignation or a dismissal. What I think is important in this context to also look at the mood in society, and it's quite interesting that in December 2023, According to a poll by the Kiev um, International Institute of Sociology, a very reliable source for opinion poll tracking, because they also ask the same questions over long periods of time. And interestingly enough, there only 8% said that there were even serious disagreements between Zelensky and Zaluzhny. And that is after Zaluzhny had also in the West publicized his views about what was not going right in the war and the potential stalemate. But it highlights in the majority, vast majority said there were only little and not very important disagreements between them or no disagreements. So you can say maybe society also puts forward some wishful thinking in this regard, but nevertheless, it, it really um, signals to both these, to Zelensky and to Zaluzhny, that the expectation is that they cooperate. And if you dig deeper into those figures, those opinion polls, you also see that trust in Zelensky and trust in Zaluzhny isn't a polarized affair. So it's not the case that some people trust one more than the other. So that's a tiny min minority where that's the case. So the expectation really is that that unity at the top has to hold. And any any step against that would, I think, open up um, pretty big issues in politics, also in, in the military, but also in particular in society that is highly mobilized. Well, let's talk a little bit more about society. What's your sense from your contacts and your experience of the mood in Ukraine coming up to the second anniversary of the start of the full-scale invasion? Yes, obviously we can see signs that a war, as any long war would, is taking a toll on society and we see obvious signs of exhaustion. But we actually see, and I would emphasize that, we see still a surprising unity from both anecdotal evidence, but also what opinion polls tell us, what other research tells us, that the country knows at the society level there is just no alternative to fighting Russia and fighting to the end. So there's no support and no increasing support that is significant. It varies a bit over time for any concessions, for negotiations. So that hasn't overall changed. What we see changes in, for example, if a question is asked in a poll, 
is Ukraine going in the right or in the wrong direction at the moment? I mean, this is obviously a very rough measure and a, and a very vague question, but we see an increase to up to a third of people are not sure or say it's not going in the right direction. But actually, you could say maybe the more surprising thing is that it's still a, a clear majority that thinks that ultimately it will go in the right direction and Ukraine will will prevail and, and there will be a better future. If, if questions are asked in a bit more nuanced way, where do you see Ukraine's a future? What kind of a country will it be in 10 years from now? Again, some more hesitant voices have, have come up, but nevertheless, there's a rise from about 5% in 22 in the autumn to 19% now, so about 20%, saying that from now on it's, it's, it's a pessimistic outlook. There will be a, Ukraine will be a destroyed country, a destroyed economy, and mass immigration will be one of the main features. But as before, a vast majority, again, over 70%, it's, it's come down somewhat, envisages Ukraine as a prosperous country within the European Union. And I think what's important to keep in mind that obviously these types of statements from the public in opinion polls might express hopes as much as also as civic duty and not always actual emotional, actual expectations. But nevertheless, they are a very important signal to uh, the political leadership. And there's an absolute consensus about Ukraine's political direction and also that about what needs to be done now, that there's absolutely no alternative to it. So I think that highlights that it's important when the discussion sometimes focuses, and rightly so, also on, on the military details, also on particular weapon systems and the day-to-day -day tracking of this, to look at society and track the mood, because it's, it's sometimes also maybe a bit of a corrective, or at least it shows us what the expectations are that policymakers in Ukraine and also outside of Ukraine will have to take into account and will have to act upon. Thank you, Gwen. Moving on, just st well, staying with the domestic scene in Ukraine then, are there any developments, domestic developments, that you think people outside the country should be paying more attention to and know about? I think in terms of the main political landscape, there are no major changes yet. And there can't really be because this is not politics as usual. But what we can clearly see is that although also his popularity has gone down somewhat, President Zelensky is really the only key political figure people put trust in. And in some opinion polls, Zaluzhny isn't in the same isn't included in the same questions because he hasn't clearly stated that he has political ambitions. That might be one of the issues in the background. If that becomes more obvious, then maybe that becomes a more, more open rivalry. But there isn't really anybody else on the political scene that comes vaguely close to either popularity, the popularity of Zelensky, or expectations that somebody could deliver on anything else like military victory or reconstruction or getting into the EU. So I think that is unchanged. It varies a bit and it's always important how also questions are asked. If you compare Zelensky to other politicians, then it's so clear that there isn't anybody coming even close. If it's uh, if you measure also trust and distrust at the same time, you can see that there is a increase in a slight increase in also distrust in the president, but even more importantly in other political institutions. So usually the big trust in the leader and the president, in particular at war times, means that trust for the government overall, for example, goes up. But what we see there now is while Zelensky Zelensky is relatively stable, going somewhat down, but nevertheless really clearly at the top. Political other institutions like the government or parliament are going back down to lower levels of trust. So that means it's really, there's not much of an institutional architecture that backs, that backs this. And that also maps some of the challenges once you move, hopefully at some point, into a post-war era, then really the main challenge is already very obvious, redesigning the entire political landscape and strengthening institutions which are currently not functioning but also not being trusted very much. Can I ask a sort of slight follow-up question? Maybe it's not supposed to be too cheeky, but what do you think maybe you've learnt that you didn't appreciate beforehand about Ukraine in the past two years? And what, maybe to put it another way, what do you think maybe you've got wrong that actually you've learnt a bit about over the past 18 months? 
Well, I think a part of it is an honest answer to the question, did we and could we have foreseen the escalation of a war that is going on since 2014? No, I think it's also always very important to emphasize that now this is a 10-year war that's going on because also occupying and annexing um, Crimea was an act of war, although many chose not to label it le like that. But that was more maybe a, a political problem rather than one in, in research terms. But nevertheless, to say that this escalation was had to happen, many of many people say that today. So I think that they are, would be careful. But what really surprised me to some extent, um, how we can now see almost a, a continuous line from the repeated rounds of mass mobilization in Ukraine that we've seen, some actually starting even before the collapse of the Soviet Union, but then in the 90s, in the 2000s, and then very strongly with the Orange Revolution and the Yoromadan in 2013 and 14. And I, I studied these these events and individuals involved in these events. And you, you can see cases, or there are actually a few cases where you see so much protest, mass protest, hundreds of thousands of people in the street several times in a very condensed period of time. But then connecting that now to a war setting, how you can see, and it's not, I don't think that invalidates necessarily the research maybe I and others have done, but to actually see how those types of networks that form in society, and that's not only civil society in an organized way, but what it does with individuals. So for example, just as a footnote, interesting enough, when people also before the full-scale invasion were asked about what institutions they trust. And there was always the president, there was always the army, but there was also volunteers, ordinary citizens, was very high up. I mean, in a way, that's an odd institution not to have it even up there so high. But that then to see that unfold in war times, what that means for the mobilization in terms of both military and civil resistance, I think that is to see that in front of your eyes is still a surprising thing. Although now we see more clearly that the foundations were laid through this period of, in particular, repeated protests against the government. Just a few more questions from me, Gwen, before I hand over to Dom, who I know has got a few. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, it's a, it's a difficult thing to sort of talk about, isn't it? This sort of perceived potential democratic deficit within the country in the sense that they were due to have a presidential election. Of course, martial law means that they don't have to. That's the law. Uh, Zelensky has talked about this himself. How much of a problem going forward do you think this is? And do you see any prospect of this being changed? Well, I think we have to be honest and say that wartime is not one in which democracy, as we, we like to see it, can function. And I think it's simply unrealistic to think that under, well, not under martial law, but that you lift martial law to have elections and then maybe return to martial law would somehow rectify the situation. So, I mean, these elections wouldn't then end martial law in the sense of mobilizing the country and also uh, redesigning some of the decision-making procedures. So that's one thing, so that it, it would be one moment and then there might be and will have to be a return to, to martial law afterwards. And also martial law is always for a certain period of time and it gets renewed and parliament is in, in Ukraine is involved in that. Actually in mid-February this will be necessary again to extend it and I expect it will be extended. Ukrainian society has absolutely no problem with not having elections right now. A vast majority supports not having them now. And then I think if we uh, move this forward, because in particular outside of Ukraine, and then some of that was echoed, I think, by Zelensky, there, there have been voices saying you need to have elections and it needs to be all dem democratically legitimated. But what kind of democracy or what kind of democratic elections are these? I mean, it's not only about having elections, as we just heard, even, I mean, Russia has elections and has present presidential elections coming up and we're not considering those sort of real elections. So what kind of elections would we have in this moment in Ukraine, um, be it parliamentary or presidential elections? And it's not just the moment of elections. You would also have to have a democratic, a fair, a transparent election campaign. So as we hinted at already, there are no clear political structures right now, neither in parliament, opposition parties that were in parts affiliated with forces in Russia are not in existence. So there isn't really a clear sort of this is the government, these are opposition parties, they are or maybe nominating candidates or even at presidential elections, different types of candidates coming forward. This cannot 
form right now. So that means that's not part of a democratic setting that we would also need to really call this democratic elections. So what you would actually do is you would force candidates to polarize, to, to gain a profile, and that can only be happening by criticizing what's happening right now. And although one might criticize things, this undermines unity at the top at a very critical moment in, in this war against Russia. So I think those calculations are all part of it. So it's easy to say you need elections because that's democracy, but the context just isn't one that allows the preparation and also then the conduct of these elections. How about all, I mean, a third, a quarter to a third of the population is on the move, either inside of Ukraine or they're based outside. Uh, how will everybody participate? The time resources spent on this to make that vaguely possible, and many people will still be disenfranchised, be it near the front line, um, be it outside of Ukraine. So a lot of the conditions are not in place that would actually make this an election that you could call really democratic. And so then I can't see the value of that, and I can see a lot of risks that actually it would use, uh, lead to much more disunity right now. Having said that, going forward, well, after the war, whenever that is, you will need to move to elections quickly. And then also the political landscape will have to de redefine itself. And it will potentially look very different from what was there before the full scale invasion. And I expect that questions who did what during the war, when will be an important cleavage when new parties, new contenders for the presidency will come forward. And obviously then there's going to be a key issue too if, if Zaluzhny perhaps is one of the contenders and Poroshenko is waiting in the wings, not very successfully, but he will still throw his, his uh, will go into this race too probably. But that's already all for a different period. So I think it's a real non-starter, this discussion, and it raises sort of some some doubts about Ukraine as a democracy, but that really, I think, is something that's a that's something that's a comment that shouldn't come from outside of Ukraine, and it, there shouldn't be a need to pick it up inside of Ukraine either, just because, in particular, some Republican leaders in the U.S. brought this into the debate. Thank you. That's a really fascinating answer. I would say that we asked a similar question to, well, we touched on similar themes really with Simon Schuster over the weekend. Listeners can listen to that special episode. I think it's last Saturday we put it out. And he, I remember he said he was, he was, he was pleased. He, he thought it was a good sign that Zelensky himself was very open about this and seemed to be, the, the, the sort of temptation of power didn't seem to be something that was, that was impacting him too much. Well, just final Quick question from me then before I hand over to Dom. Just let's talk about a bit more about your work in the Zentrum for Oster Europa. I'm so sorry if I've pronounced that incorrectly. Could you tell us a little bit? <laughs> ZOIS, can you tell us about some of the stories and studies that you'd particularly like to draw out and bring our attention to? Well, thank you for that possibility. I mean, I would like to encourage anybody interested really to check our bi weekly blog, the Soy Spotlight. It's in English. And researchers write in a brief blog format about topical issues based on their research. And there's a lot on Ukraine. Our research institute has existed since 2016. We did a lot of research on Ukraine, social science research, both quantitative, qualitative work. But we also do research on other countries, on Moldova, on Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Central Asia, on Poland to some extent. So you find our choice researchers, but also invited guest researchers from around the world to write in this, this blog format that might be on a number of issues, something interesting. We have another format at Soyuz Report where also again academics write for non-academic audiences about fresh data and we're looking at a number of things. We're looking at displacement from Ukraine, so in this fact that there's almost like an even more transnational Ukraine emerging with people outside of Ukraine also being very involved in many ways in what's happening in the country. So we have a, a bigger study on that. We are starting in new project looking at the effect of trauma on society and probably also political expectations. But there's also things on other other countries in the region, which I would like people to have a look at. Thank you very much, Gwen. Dom, I know you've got a couple of quick questions, please. Yeah, a couple if I may. Gwendolyn, hi, thanks so much for joining us today. I wonder if I can move away from so Ukraine directly and ask um, if, if we could just sort of take the temperature of Germany at the moment, please. We're really interested in your and your views on what's happened to the Zeitung vendor. And if you could give us a, a view on that, maybe you might have to explain it because it's been so long since we've heard heard anything from Mr. Schultz or anyone anyone there. And also, 
what kind of pressure is there? We get sort of snippets about the rise of the AFD and the, and the far right in Germany. Just wonder if you could give us a, a realistic view on, on the state of German politics. Thanks. Well, Chancellor Scholz has recently come out more as somebody asking other EU member states to step up support for Ukraine, which is interesting. So he is trying to position himself now as someone at the forefront of guaranteeing more long term support. And Germany has, in terms of numbers, has has upped its support at a time when also the German budget has been under pressure. But at the same time, there is, and you mentioned it at the beginning, there is still no answer, no clear answer, and no clear answer means for the time being a no on the supply of the Taurus. So it's it remains ambivalent. And what I have perceived all along is that the German government, well, ultimately, basically Scholz is the voice of the government, but there isn't always agreement across the different ministries. So I think, and that is is something that shouldn't really happen in these in these times. So, but he's, Scholz himself seems to be trying to get away from this position of somebody who has who has been hesitant and has been seen as even more hesitant because I would say of really bad communication as well. Was trying to change this, and at the same time, I think it is a genuine effort to rally around more long-term support because potentially the writing is on the wall and everybody's afraid of a Trump victory in the US and then a certain time window might be closing and the question really whether Europe as a whole and also beyond the EU, obviously the UK is part of that, could could step in more and can make up for what might fall away, which is highly doubtful. So I see that in that context. But And there's also more emphasis on, again, the need to do this because, and that ties in with domestic politics, and you mentioned it, yes, the, the right-wing extremist party, the AfD, is on the rise in the polls, and there are a number of regional elections in Germany this year, and in particular in East Germany, they are doing well. So that's that has more domestic reasons, but the issue of the war and support for Ukraine is a part of it. But I don't see it instrumentalized as much, so far at least, as, for example, it was in, say, Slovakia or in Poland. So we're not there. It's mostly a conglomerate of mostly domestic issues but it's not it's definitely possible that it takes on a more important role as the election campaigns get going thanks and just one more for me if i may and it's tied to the zeitung vendor idea if the u.s shift policy either you know, this is biden a biden administration or another trump administration do you think Germany, if there was a void of American leadership and there was a requirement, if the same level of support for Ukraine was to be met, it would require the EU, Britain, Germany, France, you know, other other major powers to step up. Do you think there's appetite for that in Germany? Or if the US were to shift, dramatically shift policy regarding support for Ukraine, it wouldn't be there. Mr. Schultz and German politics more broadly just wouldn't have the the base with which to say, right, we've got to take the lead here. I would like to say they would be able to take the lead, but I'm not sure. I think they are realizing, I mean, talking in very general terms now, that's expected, but that is not a role that comes naturally to probably anyone in German government and definitely not to the current government under Schultz. But I think the this recent emphasis on, on more long-term support and also stepping up support, which is already partly controversial also in, in German society, signals this realization that of the expectations before even that expectation was sometimes I think put to the side and it's it's really a shift in an, an, a necessary shift in, in German thinking and also in German political strategic thinking and that is ongoing but I think it, it won't happen fast enough if indeed Trump wins the elections but maybe in this context I just wanted to add briefly too in this whole Zeitenwende discussion what I thought was really also surprising to me, I'd been outside of Germany for a long time, but then had been back already a bit before Russia's full-scale invasion. I was surprised how quickly German society actually got ahead of the German government in terms of also military support, supporting this. And even now, although you hear different things, but opinion, public opinion is still in support of that. It often depends very much on the way how you've asked the question and how much you scare people with the wording of the question. But if it's a very neutral question, a majority definitely supports continued long-term military support for Ukraine. 
And recently, surprisingly, somehow support for financial support dropped off more than the military support. Probably people think that's money that could go elsewhere in Germany and shouldn't go, but obviously military support also costs money. So I think that to me, that and that basically for a long time, then German society was ahead of the government in actually implementing anything to do with Zeitenwende. Now maybe they are at the same level, but I think that's for Germany, at least in historical terms, this is actually fast rethinking and learning. But for the current context, it's always too slow and it's seen as hesitant and it's not enough and it will not happen until or not be fully implemented until the autumn. Well, thank you very much, Gwen, for your time. We'll come back to you at the end of this recording for your final thoughts. Thank you very much, Dom, for your questions as well. Let's, I'm just going to mute you, Gwen. Hamish, let's come to you. Hamish, thank you so much for joining us and ahead of some time off, as I understand it, for you. And thank you so much for waiting until we get to you today. Where would you like to start? I know you've got some sort of, you've got a sort of grand sense of Putin's tactics, strategy against the West and how you think we should respond. (laughs) Yes. Hi. Good, good afternoon. And uh, yeah, no, I think that a couple of things and uh, just pick up some of the bits and pieces you are saying. He, so some people might have seen my piece in the paper today about really about Putin's trip to Kaliningrad um, last week and what that really meant. I found it very interesting. I know we discussed it earlier on in this pod, what foreign minister of Poland has been saying, Radzlaw Sikorsky, um, to the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung about the threat, Putin's threat to Poland, Latvia and Finland, and the fact that nuclear weapons in Kaliningrad um, bring Berlin into range. So I think the nuclear thing, although we've discussed it before, I think Putin's nuclear strategy is completely defunct, but he still bandies it around. The paper broke the news at the end of last week that the Americans were going to station tactical nuclear weapons in the UK at Lake and Heath, I believe that's the first time in 15 years. Some of you old enough will remember Greenham Common, where they were previously. But I, I, th- I think the US move, and obviously approved by the UK, is a good move because that, to me, sort of nullifies any sort of tactical rhetoric, tactical nuclear weapon rhetoric coming out of, of Moscow. But I, I do sympathise with the Poles. And um, Galetti's piece in The Spectator, I think that some of you will have seen, is also very interesting about Putin's tactics and whether part of the trip to Kaliningrad is to test the water and maybe a small Russian thrust in the north of NATO's area, perhaps up in the in the high north of Finland. What would NATO do? So I think Putin's whole plan at the moment is to give NATO a lot of different things to think about. And Kaliningrad, to me, underlines that. I assume it was Putin. I did have a very good brief from somebody who knows about these things some months ago that he does have some people who look very like him, who sometimes fill in for him. But let's assume it is him. I think, first of all, a big message back home that that the president can travel around and uh, presumably in international airspace presume you have to go in this international airspace to get into Kaliningrad, which is betwixt two NATO countries in Northern Europe. So I expect a very strong message ahead of his election coming up in a few weeks' time. So very much a home message. There's lots of people, and perhaps I mentioned as well in my piece where there's some sort of provo- provocation, especially when Moscow spokesmen say it wasn't a provocation. Uh, we, we generally assume that what comes out of the Kremlin is usually about 180 degree degrees opposed to the truth. But let's park that. I think it is very much about trying to yeah, g- give NATO lots of different things to think about. We slightly allied to General Patrick Saunders' piece, yes, last Wednesday at, at Twickenham, his brief that perhaps the UK military, particularly the UK army, had really reached a size where it needed to look very deeply about the future. And if we were going to engage in conflict with the Russians, we would need to increase by a huge fold that capability. I mean, interesting enough, we see the professional British army now about 70,000. That would be exhausted pretty quickly in any conflict. And of course, the Russian regular army was finished by about October, November 2022 after the 
illegal invasion of Ukraine. And majority of the 600,000 Russian soldiers in Ukraine now are conscripts uh, with very little training, w- which is why they are suffering so badly. And Patrick Saunders basically saying we, m- we must make the same mistake. Also, by trying to create these diversions for NATO countries, virtually every NATO country is complaining that his ammo stores are getting very low and they should focus on rebuilding them in case they um, do have to fight the Russians. My, my sort of point in my piece is, well, actually, if, if Ukraine does not prevail and we don't give enough ammunition, then that will all, all be too late. I think also it's not, it, it's the, everything that's happening in the Middle East at the moment, although that we're not saying that, that Russia is directly involved, it very much plays into Putin's playbook to have so much focus there from the US and other and the UK. I mean, Royal Navy is pretty much based out there, although we now understand that the UK aircraft carrier is going to be heading out there to replace the American one. So, so, but my point being is that is a hell of a commitment for the British military focusing down in the Middle East rather than in Europe. And again, I think this is playing into what Putin is is hoping. So it's something that one needs to look at very closely. It it was interesting to hear Trump, who seems pretty certain he's going to be the president in January 2025, saying we're very close to the Third World War, but don't worry, when he is back in power in the White House, he will sort it out. So I suppose the only thing in there is we assume that actually Trump doesn't think we're very close to World War Three. Certainly, if he thinks we can wait until January 2025 to sort it out. So that was really the tenets of my piece there. And as as we've discussed, you've discussed earlier on in the pod, as we get more into the spring and as hopefully the Russian offensive is exhausted, it is then up to the Ukrainians to stamp their mark before all these elections come about. And uh, they're not going to be able to do that unless we provide them with the hardware and the software in order to do it. Thank you very much, Hamish. So so just to sum up your position there, which I think you made right at the end of your point, drawing all of this together, what should Western countries take from it? What, What Western countries must take from it is that not worrying necessarily about their own ammunition stocks and the state of their own military They must make sure that we keep supplying Ukraine with all that it needs, because if we're looking to trade ground, as it were, which, you know, elements of Ukraine, we will we will just not be in position. Russia must be stopped where it is at the moment and pushed back if it heads further west. That is where Trump's prophecy might come to reality. Well, thank you very much, Hamish de Bratton-Gordon and Dom and Gwen for all of your time. Let's move to our final thoughts then. Dom Nichols, can I come to you first? Sure, thanks. Well, I was very lucky to chat earlier on today with Lord Ricketts. Peter Ricketts, he's chair of the European Affairs Committee of the House of Lords here in, in Britain. That's the committee appointed to look at the UK's relationship with the EU, now that we're, now that we're out. They've re- released a report today called The Ukraine Effect, the Impact of Russia's Invasion on Ukraine. It, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, it's 96 pages, but it's it's good. <laughs> and it's on the website now. Anyway, we had a good chat, which I think is going to be out in the next couple of days. But if you've got, um, if you've got a few minutes, it is worth looking, look, going to look at, look at the report for the executive summary, if nothing else. We talked about sanctions and whether or not these uh, the, the frozen Russian assets, if it's too problematic to actually sell the properties, the yachts, the God knows what, etc., etc. The interest on the financial holdings, which is just a financial sum, that is much more available. Because let's say in the future, some court, the ICJ, maybe, if they say, no, 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 you've got all that wrong, it's illegal, hand it back. It's a lot easier to hand back a lump of cash than to try and glue a yacht back together or what have you. So the interest on any frozen monies could well be up for grabs. He spoke about, uh, grabs. He spoke about that. We spoke about the sale of Chelsea Football Club and how Foreign Office Minister here, Leo Doherty, uh, he left the committee with a very strong impression that Roman Abramovich, the uh, the Russian billionaire owner, owner of Chelsea, the reason the sale is going through so slowly is that uh, Mr Doherty thought that, or gave the impression that Abramovich was saying that the funds for that, which was uh, supposed to be for the, re- the reconstruction of Ukraine, Abramovich only wanted to be spent in the occupied areas of Ukraine, which Lord Ricketts thought was off 
We spoke about the Estonia plan, the 0.25% of GDP, um, and also uh, what might happen from an EU and UK perspective regarding support for Ukraine in the event of an, another Trump presidency. I also then asked him, he's, a, a, he's been in the Foreign Office 40 years, Lord Ricketts, so he's a very seasoned diplomat. He was, the, he was Britain's first national security advisor. And so I asked him, we get lots of messages from our wonderful listeners, many of whom are frustrated, angry, anxious about the future. I asked him as a seasoned diplomat what his message would be for uh, for us. And he was, to paraphrase, he said, we are right to be concerned and to look out for each other, but it's not all doom and gloom. We do have the power to change it. Anyway, that uh, interview is going to be out in the next couple of days. Do keep an eye out for that or an ear out, one of the two. Thank you very much, Dom. Hamish, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you. As you mentioned, I am off somewhere. I'm off to East Africa very shortly. The UK's national airline willing, of course. And hopefully I'll be listening to the pod from the equator on Friday. And my next piece for the Telegraph is probably going to be a a travel piece rather than the usual stuff that I write. But I I will be very, I'm looking forward. That's probably the wrong word, but I will be fascinated to see what the Middle East and the war in Europe looks like from the equator from down in Africa. And uh, I will report back. But um, see you in a few weeks. Well, have a very well-deserved holiday. Enjoy your time off. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gwen, as our guest, would you like the very final words? Thank you very much. One thing we didn't talk about today, but this week we also obviously need to look at Brussels and dynamics in the EU in terms of going ahead or not going ahead with that big Ukraine facility, 15 billion euros, which Viktor Orban um, is trying to block. If that money comes through, it would, according to the Kiel um, Ukraine support tracker, actually for the first time put the EU ahead of the US in committed aid. That's not immediately delivered aid, but promised aid. But there is interesting political bargaining going on if this aid now has to be voted on every year chunk by chunk which leaves veto rights basically to Orban and possibly others every year or whether they still can find some sort of a deal and that is I think an illustration of the times we're moving into where every bit of support will be politically extremely disputed instrumentalized and that causes obviously huge problems and then I would just like to end with that plea that I mentioned before that to actually keep focusing on Ukrainian society, the reality they actually live in, and that that war is not as far away from us as it sometimes seems, and as some politicians seem to suggest again, in terms of justifying certain policies. And what we discussed today, and thanks for making room for that, this remaining unity inside Ukraine, despite everything one could imagine already, or in view of everything happening, much more divisions popping up, but it's not the case. And on many questions, also including territorial concessions, trust, distrust in individuals or institutions, we actually see very similar trends across the whole country. So sometimes there's still leftovers of this idea of that there's all kinds of underlying divisions in Ukraine. This is not what we're seeing now. It wasn't really true before the full-scale invasion, but we also don't see that now. And that's important, I think, to keep our eyes on those trends. Thank you, Dom, Gwen and Hamish. Recently, I spoke to Anna Hosaska and Olga Shapak. Anna is a political analyst and journalist with a storied career. She's a former staff writer at The New Yorker, who's also written commentaries for The New York Times, Washington Post and Politico. Olga's background is that of a scientist who resigned her position at the Moscow Academy of Sciences to return to Ukraine to help her people. She is director of the charity Assist Ukraine. Both Anna and Olga have been heavily involved in supplying aid to Ukrainians, and I wanted to hear more from them about their experiences. Here is our conversation. Anna and Olga, thank you so much for your time today. Would you start just by introducing yourselves and telling us a bit about yourself? Anna, why don't you go first? Okay, so I'm a journalist. Uh, Most of my life I was a foreign correspondent. I was covering wars, probably three dozen different wars. I was staff writer at the New Yorker. I was staff writer at the New Republic. And over the last 15 years, maybe, I have been a senior policy advisor in the International Crisis Group and then in the National, International Rescue Committee which mostly consisted of writing pieces about things that concerned those organizations as an in-house opinion writer. Thank you, Anna. 
Olga. I'm Ukrainian. I was born and raised in Kharkiv and graduated from Kharkiv University uh, with, a, uh, with a biology degree. But then I went to Moscow, to Russia, and all my professional life, uh, more than 25 years, was there, it was linked to Russian marine mammal studies. And I was a whale biologist, and I worked in the Arctic seas and in the Russian Far East. My, I would say, baby project for the last 10 years was the marine mammals, whales in the Okhotsk Sea, and I was happy to work with beluga whales and killer whales and the bullhead whales there. And it was wonderful work. Not much was known about marine mammals there. Plenty of animals, plenty to study. So we have a storied war reporter and a storied marine biologist. What brings you two together? Can you tell us about your volunteering over the past two years? How, do, how does it start? How come we, we three are on a call together? Okay, it all started for me by calling a friend of mine in Odessa, a historian, and I asked him, what can I do for you? Because being Polish, reading Russian, being so close to Ukraine and having witnessed so many wars, I wanted to be part of a support for this war because I have never seen a war that is so unjust as this one. And therefore, having called my friend in Odessa, Sasha Babich, he said, bring us tourniquets. I didn't know what the hell was a tourniquet, so I googled it. Then I found a provider, then I bought tourniquets, I put them in my suitcase, I arrived in Odessa, and then that's how it started. I got totally hooked. At some point, with a lot of tourniquets in the United States, I bought the American tourniquets. I didn't know how to get a little bit more. And a friend of mine, a journalist from the Atlantic, George Packer, suggested that I get in touch with an organization called Assist Ukraine, which was created, among others, by Anne Garrels, a radio journalist you will be happy to know. And so I was connected with Olga and we never separated. Thank you, Anna. Olga, what about yourself? How did you go from marine mammals to volunteering? I came to Kharkiv. My family lives in Kharkiv. My mom was in Kharkiv. My brother is his family in Kharkiv. Several days before the war, I felt restless and I worried a lot about the situation. And I just took a small bag and, and left Moscow two days before the war started. And this is where the war found me. I was in Kharkiv with my family. Immediately, I thought I had to do something. And I started to volunteer the, the next day. I didn't know many people. Of course, I knew I knew my old friends, but my circle of acquaintances in Kharkiv was not been because I didn't, I didn't live in Kharkiv for many years. But I went to the Central Square where I knew there was a big volunteer tent. And this is where I started. And we started to help soldiers and civilians, first mostly with medicine. I was responsible for medicine. It was very, very important. And that was the place known for many, many people in Kharkiv because it, it's been there for many years. And... Then I contacted my international colleagues and they started to help me. They started to send money. They offered me a table in their labs. They offered me their houses. They suggested I come there with my mom, maybe people from 10 countries or so. But they said they decided to stay in Kharkiv with my people and with my family. And this is, was the first time in my life when I asked for money. I started, I started to ask for money. My friends and colleagues, they, uh, they helped me. And then you come to absolutely new world. I, I didn't used to work with people, right? And I didn't think I could communicate well. But then the, your circle start growing tremendously and very, very fast with all possible and impossible connections. And then I met online with Art Dennison, one of the founders, a friend of uh, Anne Gerrels and one of the founders of Assist Ukraine. And Art immediately said, after the first call, Art said, okay, I'm sending you $5,000. Let's see how you work. Boom. This is how I started to work. And I became a person on the ground for Assist Ukraine because we have people in the United States. Art lives in Alaska. We have Katerina who lives in Warsaw. And all these people make a convenient logistic chain. And now we have Anna and this now, what, what is it? For half a year, maybe more, Anya. 
Yeah, a little bit more than half a year, but uh, a very, a very active half a year, I could say. Well, let, let's talk about what you've been doing in the last six months then. Um, what kind of things are you taking to the front? Where are they going? And what kind of reception do they get? Do you know the impact of, of what you've been doing? Well, it it all starts with the Olga who is identifying the needs. So let's have Olga start. Okay, so as I said, the contacts in, in my telephone, they grew and grew and grew and grew. The soldiers, they tell each other, if we help someone, then he can pass our phone number and other people will contact me. And this is how they, this is how I have my kind of baby units whom we typically help. There are several units who we help on a regular basis, but then also there are individual soldiers which find themselves in a difficult situation, could be friends of friends, relatives of friends, volunteers who used to work because I I was connected to, to a public organization in Kharkiv as well, which I knew that. And in the beginning, there were about 100 of drivers working for us when the situation in Kharkiv was very, very difficult and when there was a need for driving, distributing food and water and drugs. So a lot of our volunteers have joined the Ukrainian army. So of course, those people know whom to call if something is needed. And with the units we work on a regular basis, we try to predict their needs or talk to them and, and think what they would need. But the war is war and there are a lot of needs which are urgent. And often people call us and say, Two hours ago, our house or our cellar was blown up. It's minus five degrees Celsius, and we lost all our sleeping bags, all our winter clothes. And basically, we ran, we ran outside. We are okay, but we are almost naked. Please, please help us. And Assist Ukraine, it works very fast because we work on a complete trust and our always sends me money on my volunteer card to Ukrainian bank. So basically, I can run to the store, get something, get the sleeping bag or whatever they need, and send to them. And we have Navaposhta service. It's a postal Ukrainian postal service, which works perfectly. In spite of war, in spite of Navaposhta has been targeted so many times, and major terminals have been targeted so many times. They work perfectly. So if I send it, I know, I know that, that tomorrow it will be there. If it's very urgent and they're not so far away, again, other soldiers gave me the car and our, and the sister crane is ready to cover the, the fuel. So I jump in the car and I can drive. So this is how it works and uh, try what we can do. And what kind of reaction do you hear from the soldiers you're working with? Every, every week, sometimes more than a week, I hear that without you guys, we would not stay, we would not survive. That's very emotional. I always try to send these thank yous further along the volunteer chain because uh, everyone works and everyone dedicates time and effort and money to help soldiers. But I'm the last one who gets, you know, who runs probably the most, but who also gets all the thank yous, they're very, very thankful. And again, on the individual basis, the army, to help a soldier on the individual basis, when we think of a soldier as a human being, as a person, the army as a huge bureaucratic machine simply cannot help fast enough. And this is what we can do. And this is what we do. Anna, would you like to add your thoughts and reactions to that? Yes, absolutely. Number one, I don't think that Olga uh, realizes what a gratifying uh, activity it is. All my friends around the world, I live between Warsaw and Paris and everybody is jealous because I get so many thank you notes and I say so many thank yous. And uh, frankly, I love joining Olga when she goes to the front line because I'm just basking in all those kisses and thank you and and the smiles of the people, the, their face, it just brings tears to my eyes to think of those guys who are, you know, big tough guys in their uniforms and they are most like little babies when you bring them some 
warmers for the, their feet or chest seals or tourniquets or anything as prosaic and this. It's a, it's a very, very gratifying thing. And another thing I want to add is that what attracted me in Olga's work is that it is helping the army. It is a non-lethal, but yet it is for the army because at the beginning in Poland, it was all about pampers and teddy bears and... Uh, the founder of Assist Ukraine said that what Ukrainians need is not teddy bears, but uh, bulletproof vests. I happen to have one at home, by the way. I have worked myself in the International Rescue Committee, a big, big humanitarian organization in the United States, and I know how much they help Ukraine, but they help in another way. And I think, and Olga knows it better than I, how important it is to help the army. If we don't help the army, there won't be any more Ukraine, in a way, because we will let uh, Putin have it his way. They have nowhere to, to withdraw, so we have to help the army. I, I'm not for providing munitions, but what we do provide is absolutely essential, and as Olga said, it's something that the Ministry of Defense is not capable of doing so is such a speedy way and such an efficient way. Well, thank you, Anna. We have millions of listeners who've been listening to this podcast for, for nearly two years now, and they've been hearing about the front lines, hearing about the line of control. Obviously, very, very few people listening to this would have been there. I've been close, but I have not been to the, the front lines. Can you tell us what it's like being in that situation? And what do you see? What would you want listeners who have no experience of this to understand about that place? Well, I, I go close to the front lines. I don't go to the front lines. I don't jump in the trenches. So the soldiers go to the trenches and they perform military tasks. But then they retrieve and they usually have a house or some place to stay in the nearest town or village to the front line so that they can recuperate and sleep and wash clothes, which is dry and wet, for example, and charge the electronics. So when we bring humanitarian aid, we don't go to the trenches because there is no need to go there. So we go to those to those near front line villages, basically the last living towns near the front line where we bring our aid to soldiers. I often see the soldiers who come from their tasks because someone meets me and then and then a group can be rejoining, of course, dead, tired, dirty. The guys need simply like sleep. Wash and sleep, or first maybe sleep and then wash. But these villages, they still live their lives. But there are not many people, many empty houses, many ruined houses. Not many shops are open. So sometimes they simply, the guys even would cover, would return money, would reimburse me. But sometimes they ask me to bring something from Kharkiv because there are much, many more. The Kharkiv lives almost normal life. Uh, the stores are open and it's the, the selection is it's more the prices are much cheaper than in those small towns. The prices skyrocketed. And by the way, these soldiers they have to rent those houses to recuperate. So the guys basically spend part of their salary to rent this house to have a chance to get back to normal. This is where I go. And these villages they sometimes there are rocket, there's shelling, UFs flying above them. There's certain danger of going there, but not as much. And I would say that when Russians were close to the city, Kharkiv was shelled uh, on a regular basis. And even now, we got used to it from the first days, from the first day war, to the shellings and to the bombings from the airplanes. And even now, Kharkiv is so close to Russian border, to Belgrade Oblast, that when they shell the C-300 rockets, First, we hear the blast. Only after that, the air raid alarm will, will, will go. So we are immune to those things. So I, would, I, wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say that what, that what I'm doing is, is a big adventure because I don't see much difference. It's a long, sometimes it's a long, difficult road, yes. But otherwise, I don't see it as extremely dangerous uh, work. Anna, what's been your experiences going to near the front? Well, I go with Olga, so I'm learning from Olga, but let me tell you that where Olga goes, there is hardly any women and hardly anybody without uniforms, and most of the cars have those kind of sweater 
camouflage net on them, which is quite funny. They look like they are ready for winter, which of course <laughs> reminds me about the camouflage nets. It's quite interesting that Olga has to uh, carry the camouflage nets, big balloons of those, and depending on the weather, if there is snow, then she has to take a big bowl of camouflage net, which is white, so that all those vehicles will be covered in white and won't be seen. And uh, of course, depending on the weather, we bring uh, thermal clothes or we bring uh, things for surviving the winter with the gas heaters, etc. This brings me also to the way that that the Ukrainians are inventive on their ways because the empty gas containers are all turned into little heaters. They are called burzhuika. They are the because they look like bourgeois, like big fat uh, things, and the soldiers have uh, constructed them. The way that the Ukrainians are inventive is just incredible. I mean, at the beginning, there was the periscopes, for instance, which were made from the plumber's pipes put together. The way that the first bulletproof vests were made from sawn-off plowshares and things like this. I mean... You, you want to join them because they are so incredibly inventive that you learn, which is, you know, which goes from the pipes to, to drones. Drones are is very important, and I think the whole world can learn from the Ukrainians about the way that they make their drones more and more effective. It's very, very impressive. Unfortunately, there is something to learn from Russians as well. And this is why trophy, trophy Russian drones are so important as well. well it's, a war, it's a war of drones. It's becoming, and, and, and I'm not the first one who will say it, but it's a, it's a terrible combination of the World War I trench warfare and 21st century technology competition. And it's terrible, but it's interesting to watch and just recently I saw, I saw in the Telegram channel in the news the, the video where the Ukrainian drone, flying drone, hits the Russian terrestrial drone. And, uh, and it was said that, well, the, the whole world is, is watching these videos as, a, as an interesting computer game, but the military, the, the armies of the whole world are watching this thinking that they have to change the entire system, the entire approach to the modern war. I watched the same drone exactly as you say here in Odessa, you know, whether it's Odessa or it's Kharkiv, we watch the same things and and we cheer them. I was on the way from Poland, I just brought a car that, you know, it's a good example, David, for how it happens. Olga tells me that there is Vitali who works with the National Guard and he needs to evacuate broken cars from the front line so because the the evacuator cannot come all the way to the front line so i did a little bit of crowdsourcing in poland we asked money for one car and the poles were so enthusiastic that we got money for two and a half cars so it was one normal car and one very powerful car and this is on a Polish YouTube. We got all this money it's entirely. So all this thing about fatigue, etc. I mean, I don't believe it. The Polish people stepped in. I bought the car. I brought it. On the way here, I stopped in Lviv because a friend of mine who produces or whose company, it's not even a company, his group produces 10,000 FPV drones every month nowadays. And um, just to tell you how I can share my experiences from other wars, I have a friend in Afghanistan who is employing in orthopedic center only handicapped people, only. And I suggested this to my friend Alexander Yakovenko, whose group is producing those FPV drones, and he came to Lviv and made a speech to the amputees and other invalids, inviting them to join in producing the drones. So it was very moving. Then I, I drove the car here, 
and you have the friend of, of Olga, Vitali, the one who is helping to evacuate the cars, br- brought the car. We are handing it over as we are speaking today. My final question really is, I mean, Anna, you've sort of half touched on this, I think, but we've heard a lot in the news about fatigue. It's, it's, I think it's the wrong word, but it's the word people are using. So let's say that. The debates and arguments over funding for Ukraine in the EU, in the US, ha- has what you do become more difficult as well? Or are you seeing the same level of support more, or more support or less support over the past few months? Uh, how are you set for the coming months and the coming year? Overall, watching the humanitarian aid entering Ukraine, I definitely see the decrease. But I wouldn't say that uh, assist Ukraine has this problem. We try to work, we try to work with the donors and it seems that our, how to say, audience is is listening. And we have, uh, when we started, it was difficult to, we had the difficulties in the beginning that we don't have now, I would say, because in the beginning, a lot of people rejected helping soldiers saying that they don't, that they don't want to participate in the war. They don't want to have blood on their hands or they don't want to to help soldiers because the country is already sending huge amount of military aid to Ukraine. And we had to work and explain that those things are completely different. And uh, I mean, the military aid to to the army, to the state and to to the soldiers, to the people. Plus, we we had to explain that non-lethal aid in the form of equipment even like thermal cameras, like drones with thermal cameras. It's necessary for survival. It's basically like a tourniquet. If you send a tourniquet, you must understand that the wounded person may be saved with a tourniquet, but if this person has a thermal camera and sees the enemy, then he might not be wounded to begin with. It's either them or us. And But they have choice to go, and we don't have a choice to go. We have no place to go. So th- this is the war, and people, I, I myself, I, I remember myself thinking about war in my dreams, and the, you live a normal life, and but you think about those kind of other realities or what your grandparents had to go through. And I always thought that I would not be able to take any part in war, and definitely I would not be able to take a gun. I just can't. I just, I, I, I can't hit a person. And it changes the very moment you are placed in this situation. People have not changed. As a, as a biologist, they can say, people have not changed. Believe me, they have not changed within the last 2,000 years, not to talk about the, the Second World War. Nothing changed. As soon as you get into this situation, all your instincts, carefully hidden by our moral and ethic norms, they rise. And this is what leads you. And self-survival is not the last one. And we definitely have to, we definitely have to follow it. And basically I take the help, I take my help to soldiers basically as a self-survival instinct. Because if I don't help them who protect us, I will be killed because I know that the I will be in a big, big, big trouble if I get into the hands of Russians. Well, the no change, I think that it's a little bit too early to say how disastrous it will be. Uh, I think that there was some pressure to have more transparency and they went a little bit overboard and there is a risk that they will throw the baby with the water because the way that we have to do the reporting on the humanitarian aid that will bring may be a little bit too bureaucratic. But this is to be seen because it may not be as bad as that, I think. It is, however, you know, very, very important to, to allow the foreign volunteers to bring everything. Absolutely, yes. Olga and Anna, thank you so much for your time. Do you have any final thoughts or anything uh, you want to say that we've not spoken about? If I may jump in, I would say that I'm also doing it in self-defense because if we let Putin get away with what he's doing in Ukraine, we are going to be next in Poland and the whole of Europe and other countries and you have Venezuela, etc. 
I also would like to add about the non-fatigue. I think that there are people who still want to help a lot. When I wrote a piece in the New York Times about how I do my volunteer work, Assist Ukraine, which I just mentioned with the link, suddenly there was bing, 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 the money was coming. And, and R. Davidson told me $65,000 were sent in small contributions. We are speaking $25, $30 contributions. There were loads of them. I wrote a few other pieces in other places, and I saw that people do want to help. As I said, we appealed for one car, and we got money for three cars, four times more than we asked, and it continues. We just spoke yesterday with Olga about uh, making another video of appeal to get the night vision and the thermal vision instruments, which are $5,000 $5,000 each. And I know that the Polish people will contribute and will send it. I'll have to think about how to buy it cheaper and bring it, definitely. So there is no fatigue. I think that the fatigue comes from the world uh, audience rather than for the audience that we target. I think that what's happening in the U.S. is due to internal problems of the Republicans bickering among themselves rather than than everyday people who still do want and assist Ukraine is still getting people to contribute spontaneously. I would like to say about the fact that if Putin is making civilians the target of his attacks, then maybe it is absolutely normal that civilians are the volunteers and in such an important way. Olga, would you like the very final words? Yeah, David, I would like to to thank you for letting us speak today. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And, if you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.